Wow, God is doing some incredible things here. And uh, in a moment, I'm, I'm going to take us on a journey uh, in a message entitled the, the Fruitful Life. But very often when you're in the middle of something, you can't see exactly what's going on. And if, if my role today is to come all the way from Chicago to just tell you that things are looking incredible, that today is a brand new day, that what has been is not what will be, that God is about to do something incredible in your midst. If that's all you take from this, then believe it with everything because that's all I see. This is not part of my message, but Jesus says, why do you say a few months and then the harvest? I say, open your eyes, look, look, everywhere you go, it is harvest time. The seasons are changing. God is a God of seasons. And that's part of bearing fruit. But the seasons are changing. And let today be a day where you leave some of those things behind and you step into the new. All right. Once again, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Aiden. My family sends their love. But let's look at the fruitful life. We're looking at the fruitful life. You're going to hear me say this a few times. And just a heads up, I speak really quickly. I've tried to slow down but I can't. I'm either all the way in or off completely. So feel free to listen to this back later at a quarter speed uh, if you feel it's too much. All right. Fruitfulness in Scripture speaks about God's purpose for our lives, God's blessing on our lives, and God's promise for us who believe. Purpose, blessing, and promise. Fruitfulness in Scripture is a theme that follows its way. It weaves its way through both the Old Testament and the New. Fruitfulness and the opposite, barrenness, very often used by God to describe his people and his plan for his people. His plan and purpose and blessing being fruitfulness, the place where they're in being barrenness. Let's lay a quick foundation before we dive into John chapter 15. Genesis 1 verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. The first mandate, the first call, the first mission, be fruitful. God's purpose for our lives is fruitfulness. Maybe you've stopped believing that. Deuteronomy 7, 13, he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground. Not just blessing and multiplying your offspring, but blessing and multiplying the work of your hands. God's blessing over your life and my life through faith in Christ is fruitfulness. And let's look at the promise, one of my favorite scriptures, probably my all-time favorite psalm, Psalm chapter one, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates both day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruits in season. Whatever he does prospers. God's promise is fruitfulness. God's purpose is fruitfulness. God's blessing is fruitfulness. And if there's any area in your life where there may be some barrenness, God's promise over you today in that area, I'm the God who brings fruitfulness. But John 15 tells us how to walk in that fruitfulness. Fruitfulness speaks about God's purpose for our lives, God's blessing on our lives, and God's promise for us who believe. So let's read John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8, and I want to invite you to stand. Let's honor God's word this morning. I don't do this every time, but I honestly felt that we need to honor his word. We need to raise the word up, and then we're going to see the blessing flow down. All right, John 15, verse 1 to 8, and then we're going to dive deeper into scripture by scripture, line by line. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Take your seats, everyone. Line by line, let's go through this. I'm gonna start at the end in verse eight. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to me my disciples. Fruitfulness in your life brings glory to God. 
I feel some of us have come this week and we're like, God, I just wanna bring you glory. I just wanna bring you honor. I just don't know what that next step is. It's a step into fruitfulness. It's a greater step into obedience. It's a greater step into allowing his fruit to be developed in your life. Brings glory to God. Why? Because it's his purpose, blessing, and promise. I found this quite interesting when you think about it. Fruit is the one part of the tree that doesn't exist for the benefit of the tree. An orange tree doesn't sit on a summer day whenever they fruit. I don't know when they fruit themselves. And have a nice orange to celebrate the day. No. The benefit is for others. Yes, you might say, that, well, that orange tree, unless it bears fruit, there's no perpetuity, there's no continuation, but no immediate benefits. You might say, yes, when I display the fruits of the Holy Spirit in my life and God does a work in my life, yes, it feels amazing and I do, I do benefit from that, but primarily, I feel God wanting us to know this morning that the fruits in your life is to bring glory to God. He enjoys the fruits of your life. He enjoys seeing Christ formed in your life. He enjoys seeing the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life displayed but also the people that you are surrounded by get to taste and see the goodness of the Lord through the fruits in your life. But sometimes we're so inward, we're so caught up in what we're going through. The fruits in your life is for God's glory and for the benefit of others around you. Let's read verse one. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. I'm the true vine. I love this. Immediately we see uh, God the Father as a vine dresser. Vine dresser is also translated as gardener, work of the soil. I love this. Why? Because right now we see that God the Father is not afraid of getting his hands dirty. Not afraid of, of working in the mess of my life, in the brokenness of my life. He's caring for his vineyard. He's caring for his vine. He's caring for the branches and he's getting his hands dirty. You don't need to bring your Sunday best to God. You don't need to have it all together before you take that next step of saying yes. He's here, he's willing, he's already started touching and healing, but bring your brokenness to him, especially in leadership. It's so easy to live the fake life. Always having to put on that everything is perfect and everything is fine because we don't wanna let the people we're leading down. If there's sin, deal with it. Brokenness and sin are not the same thing. We don't tolerate sin, but brokenness is a byproduct of being in this world, and we all carry some level of brokenness, and God's not afraid of the dirt and helping us find healing. But you've got to come to Him, because I tell you what, healthy leaders make healthy leaders. Yes. Healthy leaders. We, when we are healthy, we reproduce the fruit of healthy leadership. And maybe your brokenness can be hidden for now, but there will come a time when it will break you. And that's not God's heart. That's the enemy's plan for you. Bring it to him today. Let's read on every branch in me that does not bear fruit. He takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. That is super encouraging. <laughs> Maybe not on first read. We've just read that God takes us away if we don't bear fruit. What does that mean? Well, if you look to your right and to your left, you might notice one or two people are missing. No, it doesn't mean that. There's been plenty of times in my life when I've been unfruitful. God didn't just take me away. Whoop, sorry, son. You had your chance, ruined it. Here we go. No, he, he doesn't work like that. Okay, two possible readings, two possible meanings. Okay, what does it mean to be taken away? First of all, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and uh, he is about to be crucified, about to face the cross. His mission is coming to an end. The final words of Jesus with his disciples, all of them were important, but zero in on these ones. Remember, Judas Iscariot is here, and possibly others, maybe even others who weren't true believers. So taking away is an actual reference to those surrounding Jesus who weren't believers, who could not bear fruit because they were not grafted into the vine. Everywhere we go in ministry, there will be people, and maybe even here today, you haven't put your faith in Christ. You haven't crossed the line. You're looking in. You haven't put your full faith in Christ. It would be our joy to pray for you. The truth is, though, that there will come a time when they are taken away. It's the sad truth. It's the sad reality that not all will put their faith in Christ. Christ desires that all would come to him, but not all will choose him. Remember the taking away of the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the weeds. The second one, which is actually really encouraging for us today because I think it applies to most of us in this room. What does it mean to take away? Well, the Greek there for takes away can also be translated as lifts up. Oh. 
You're getting a little nervous, thought you were going to be taken away because there's a little unfruitfulness in your life. No, he lifts up. Let's read that again. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. Here we have the Father looking over the branches, seeing which ones aren't producing fruit. Here we have the Father getting his hands in the dirt. Here we have the Father lifting up the branches that are maybe covered, lifting up the branches that maybe haven't got enough sunlight, in love, care, lifting them up, just as you're giving up on yourself. Just as you're giving up on yourself, God's lifting you up. Just as you feel God's given up on you, he, he's lifting you up. Just when you feel that barrenness is your portion, he's lifting you up. What does lifting up look like? I think sometimes it's a prophetic word. Ever been signaled out? Ever walked past someone and they've just given you this word and it's just like, God, you're reading my mail. I think sometimes it's a new revelation God gives you from his word. I've read that so many times and all of a sudden, whoa, God, you're good. How have I never seen that before? And it changes your life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. I think sometimes it's an encounter in his presence like we had in worship. Whoa, I wish I could package that and take that home with me and just press play every morning and wake up to that. An encounter in his presence. I think sometimes it's dramatic breakthrough in prayer, like a healing. You've been persisting, you've been plowing, you've been plowing, and all of a sudden God comes through. He's lifting you up. I think sometimes it's God putting us on display. A city on a hill can't be hidden. You are the light of the world. Maybe God's pushed you into a position where you have to become public with your faith. He's lifting you up. I think it's also times where we have a sudden awareness of brokenness in our life, where suddenly God begins to shine his light. It's like, oh, I've got sin. Oh, that's not right, God. You need to deliver me from that thing. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Sometimes we want to persist in the dirt, but God wants to lift us up. Why? Because fruitfulness speaks about God's purpose for our lives, God's blessing on our lives, and God's promise for us who believe. Let's read on. What does it say? And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear even more fruit. Let's get that word study slide up. I love this. This is super encouraging. I came to encourage us. Oh, look at that. Oh, 10 points for anyone who can pronounce that correctly. Uh, but let's jump over to the English. Uh, it means to cleanse, to purify, to prune. I, I love this part here. Removing undesirable elements, eliminating what is fruitless by purifying. And I love that one over there. It says making unmixed. Ever tried to unmix something? All the things we got mixed up in that we shouldn't have. Uh, the pruning, the cleansing is God unmixing us from those things. To the young, I would say this, it's easier to not get mixed up than it is to be unmixed. You have the choice. Maybe culture tells you you don't have the choice. Maybe culture says you have to live a certain way. I'm telling you that the Word of God says that you have been given everything you need for life and for godliness. Everything to walk in this life with godliness. And here's the deal. You walk into that stuff. God will unmix you from it if you open your heart to his cleansing. Maybe you've walked in that and you're like, oh, I've messed. No, no, he will unmix you from it. He will cleanse you. He will prune you. I've been amazed in my walk with God where all of a sudden things shift and my desires change. It's like suddenly something was okay in my life yesterday and now suddenly I have a new conviction on and I feel in God I need to separate from it. This is not legalism. This is not, maybe not even a sin issue. It's just... It just doesn't feel right anymore. That, that show I was listening to, that, that music, that was my favorite song. What's happening? It's the cleansing, purifying, pruning of God, something we've gotten mixed up in God and mixing us from. On the flip side, suddenly I have these new desires to be more generous, to be more kind, to go on a mission or volunteer more. And suddenly, I, where did that come from? God's pruned away and a desire that was not of him. And he's leading us in a new area of fruitfulness. Michael Eaton uh, a well-known commentator says this. He says, what is the spiritual equivalent of vineyard pruning? It is when God acts in our lives to cut out something that ought not to be there or to forcefully shape our lives in a way that pleases him and will be best for the plans he has for us. That sounds amazing, but honestly, that sucks. If you think about it, that's painful. Yeah. Let's not pretend that the pruning of God is always nice. Well, let's come, let's be pruned. Yeah. Oh, wow. Here's a challenge. We get to run when the Holy Spirit convicts. He doesn't hold us in place and just prune. No, no, he, he wants us to come. Willingly offering our bodies on the altar. Willingly saying, here I am, I surrender. Do your heart surgery, Lord. Yeah. 
Do your pruning, Lord. Do your cleansing work. We've been speaking about a fire. Ever been burned before? Fire burns. The cleansing fire of God is painful when we realize how sinful we are. Like Paul says, I am the chiefest of all sinners. That guy, he's pretty cool if you ask me. The cleansing fire of God. I don't know if you've ever pruned anything. Um, no horticulturist by any, any means. But I was watching my friend prune his roses the one time, and uh, he cut back quite a lot. I was actually surprised. I was like, slow down, soldier. You're not going to have much left if you keep going. It was like the time I, I had this hedge in, in my, my yard. It was, it was a fence, but the hedge was just, it was just terrible. And I was like, I'm going to neaten this up. And I started cutting, 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 cutting. Like, I spent three hours later, and I was like, yes! And then I looked back, and I'd cut away my whole fence. I had no fence. I'd cut it away. That's my pruning. But when God prunes, it's different, thankfully. But my friend and his roses, sorry, I get distracted. My friend and his roses, he cut back so much. But, but that, that year, his, roses were, his rose bushes were greater. They were more beautiful. They were healthier. I was like, wow, this is incredible. They grew and outgrew where they had been. And then he repeated that the next season. While praying, I felt God say this. We can't live only off of last season's growth. Some of us are being pruned right now. We're being pruned and it's not nice. It's, you're like, God, how much more? How much more? How much more? He says, take up your cross yeah. daily and follow me. Yeah. We can't live only on yesterday's revelation. We can't keep telling testimonies of what God used to do. We need new growth, new fruit, new faith, new testimonies. For that, we need new pruning, new cleansing. And sometimes the more we cut away, the more growth we're going to see. I and mean, it's not us cutting. It's not us, oh, I'm trying to be holy. I'm trying to live a legalistic. No, no, no. It's coming to God. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's quite interesting when you think of a living sacrifice. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually quite painful because he puts you on the altar and he wants us to die. He raises us to life and we get back on the altar and we've got to die. It's the cycle of bearing fruit. Natural fact, fruits is the process of dying. But every time we bear fruit and every time we are pruned and every time his spirit does a work inside of us, it brings glory to him. Others come to know Jesus through it. They can taste and see the goodness of God through our lives. And we move forward. We blaze forward in our faith. And we change. And it's always worth it. Open your heart to the pruning. Fruitfulness speaks about God's purpose for our lives. God's blessing on our lives and God's promise for us who believe. Let's just take a moment. Hmm. I've been weeping through worship. Just the presence of God has been so beautiful. And right now, some promises have been forgotten. And he's pruning and it's sore and it's painful. But there's a harvest coming, friends. Breathe in us, I pray, oh God. Let's read on. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him. He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. I love immediately how we, we know we get to spend time with the Lord. I know we get to have this awesome relationship. It's the privilege of, that we get to walk with our Savior. And I know that we know that. But there's a mutual foundation to this relationship that maybe we miss. He says, abide in me and I in you. Jesus wants to abide in us more than we want to abide in him. Jesus wants to meet with us and encounter us with his presence more than we want to with him. That's how beautiful he is. That's how wonderful he is. And he's got grace for us and he calls us in to boldly seek his face, to boldly come in. But he wants to meet with us. And then you read Revelation 3 verse 20 with new eyes. Behold, I'm standing at the door knocking. If your heart is open to hear my voice and you open the door within, I will come into you and feast with you and you will feast with me. Are your times with Jesus a feast? What was that book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict? 
You guys remember that book? The guy sets out to prove that God isn't real or didn't exist or the cross didn't exist. And by the end of it, all the evidence he finds, he puts his faith in Christ. <laughs> Excuse me. Fruit is the evidence of life in a tree. Is your life and the fruits in your life the evidence that demands a verdict to all those around you? When you feast with Jesus, that's a byproduct. When you try to get that in your own strength, it, it, it never happens. But when you feast with Jesus, through the chaos of this life, Jesus is constantly reaching for our attention. Through the busyness of our days, Jesus is always ready and waiting to meet with us in the challenging and dark times. He's there waiting. It's just another promise over us, Psalm 139. Is there any place I can go to avoid your spirit to be out of your sight? If I climb to the sky, you're there. If I go underground, you're there. If I flew on morning's wings to the far western horizon, you'd find me in a minute. You're already there waiting. Abide in me and I in you. What does it mean to abide? I'm so glad you asked that question this morning. It just happens I've got a whole bunch of notes that I'd like to share with you on what it means to abide in Christ. The word means to, to wait, to, to don't leave. <laughs> to stay, to tarry. You know when Jesus speaks to his disciples about pouring out the Holy Spirit, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait. It's a combination of this same word, to wait. And I've got three points here that I felt God really speak to me about my own walk with him. I've had the privilege of growing up in a believing home. I've, I don't know when I put my faith in Christ, and that is a privilege. I know that not many have. And I've known, had the opportunity to know God and uh, recently I was just saying, God, I need to know you more. God, I, I want to be closer to you. Thank you for all the encounters. Thank you for all that I've been able to walk in by your goodness. But, but God, I need more. I need more of you. And I've radically been shifting how I spend time with God and how I, how I, I abide in him. So these are things that God has spoken to me, and I pray they would encourage you too. Abiding in Christ is maintaining unbroken fellowship with him. What do I mean by that? Smith Wigglesworth, a famous British evangelist, is quoted as saying, I often don't spend more than half an hour in prayer at one time, but I never go more than half an hour without praying. I hope he said that. The source of all truth, the internet told me he said that, apparently. Maintaining unbroken relationship, unbroken fellowship. Maybe another way to think of this. I was at a friend's house, and on his mantle, he had this little... Um, he yeah, had this really cool little book. It was uh, One Minute Devotions. One Minute Devotions. Maybe you've got that on your mantelpiece. Um, it said this, One Minute Devotions is perfect for anyone who is busy with life but also has the desire to walk with God. One Minute Devotions. I suppose it did sound better than 60 seconds with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Getting down to feast, Revelation 3.20. K. Oh, Lord, the, the king is there. The throne, it's just incredible. The bountiful feast. And it's like, wow. Okay, Jesus, I've got 60 seconds for you today. I'm sorry, my mind goes places it shouldn't. And I was, I, was, I was picturing going to war with a whole bunch of people standing. Remember, it's not against real people. It's against spiritual authorities and powers against the demonic horde. And you whip out the sword of the spirit and you're ready. And you look at your neighbor and he's, he's holding his little promise box. Uh, 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 oh, I used that one last week. Uh, uh. Oh, we're finished, friends. We're going to take the kingdom. We're going to take the kingdom to the end of the world. Not with your promise, Bucks. We get to feast with Jesus. And this, is, this isn't me saying, oh, you need more than a 60-second devotion. Because here's, here's the truth. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'll be honest with you. Devotions are Awesome. I love my devotion. I fight for my devotion. I prioritize my devotion. That's one of the radical shifts I've been putting in place, and I've been seeing tremendous fruit to my times with God, and it's beautiful. But here's the deal. Sometimes I have the most amazing devotion. I get into my the, I clo that little prayer room. I close the door. I meet with God, and then I walk out, and I close the door, and I just get on with the rest of my day, and I realize I left Jesus in my devotion. So maintaining unbroken fellowship with him is, is trying to create those moments in the day where I can hear from him, where I can draw strength from him. Sometimes, sometimes I'm making coffee, talking to people, and I'm like, God, oh, what are you doing? Oh, God, I need you. Going for my walk, just, just praying, God, I need you. It's not about like, trying to find a monastic existence where I can spend six hours uninterrupted in God's presence. I don't think anyone can do that. Maybe it's time to stop trying to live for a devotion and live a devoted life a life of devotion where we're walking with. That's why it's called your walk with the Lord. 
Abiding in the Lord is maintaining unbroken fellowship. A failure for me is not a day that I get to the end of where maybe I've sinned or maybe I've got grumpy with the kids or maybe I just didn't get through all my tasks. Or A failure of a day for me is where I get to the end of my day and I realize, Jesus, I'm so sorry. I, I, I just got through that day without you. Because when I do that, I realize I'm more prone to be grumpy. I'm more prone to, to lose it. I'm more prone to lack vision. I'm more prone to wander away from him. Yeah. But in actual fact, trying to redeem the time and actually walk with him, keep in step with him. Okay. Abiding in Christ is continuing to be present with him. In this day and age we live in, being present is a real challenge. Being fully present dialing in and dialing out. And it's like we're saying to Jesus, we really want you to be present right now. Like when we're praying, when we're encountering, and Jesus says, I'm present, I'm omnipresent. I'm always everywhere. I'm always everywhere present. There's never been a time or place where I haven't fully been present. That's what the omnipresence of God is. But he's not always everywhere manifest and revealed. And he's saying, you want me to be present and manifest here. He's saying, I want you to be present too. And that is a challenge in our day and age, and that is one that I am working on because my mind goes everywhere. And I realize I've just read a whole psalm and I've got to reread it because I was thinking about the things of the day. And that's all of us, and that is life. But being present, training our minds to be present. Abiding in Christ is continuing to be present with Him. When you're out shopping, Jesus is there. When you're putting in gas or petrol, Whatever you use here, he's there. Making dinner, he's still there. He's always present. Yeah. Abiding in Christ is continuing to be present with him. And, and I'm just going to be honest and share another, maybe a vulnerable story. I'm letting you into my inner world. I've been able to serve on two amazing and incredible church staffs. One in South Africa for six years and now one in America in Chicago for, for seven years. And the danger... And don't hear what I'm not saying. When a church has got great momentum and a church is moving and you've got a wonderful team around you and things are moving forward, all you need to do really is sometimes arrive on Sunday and you move forward in your faith. Why? Because everyone's corporate faith and momentum takes you forward. And that's a beautiful thing and that's God's design as well, the power of faith and agreement. But linked to the other things I've said, sometimes I've realized I've done so much for Jesus and I haven't necessarily done it all with him accomplished wonderful things. And you know what? I'm sure there'll still be some sort of reward for some of the things. But at the end of the day, realizing, oh man, Jesus, I just, I just keep going off. Being caught in the presence is, is not being too caught up in the future. And some of us are like that. We're just like, one day God's gonna do this amazing thing. One day my life, it's, he's just gonna do it. And we're living for that moment. And some of us are so caught up in the past of what God used to do. And it's like he did some amazing things and it's really easy to hold on to those things. But in the presence, like what is he doing right now? That little moment where, where I just wanted to pray. I was like, God, what are you doing now? Do you want me to shift? Do you want me to pivot? What are you doing? Leaning in. Abiding in Christ is continuing to be present with him. And my final point, abiding in Christ is reliance on him, daily reliance on him. For apart from me, you can do nothing. The truth is we can actually do quite a lot without God. My previous examples have shown that. But what he's actually saying here, you can't do anything of eternal significance. You can't do anything in the spiritual realm apart from me. You cannot live the fruitful life. You cannot live the life of purpose, the life of blessing, and the life of promise without me, apart from me. A verse that God has highlighted to me recently is this Philippians 3, verse 3. It says this, It is we who worship by the Spirit, who glory in Christ Jesus and place no confidence in the flesh. It's a beautiful verse. I'm one of those strategy guys, one of those get stuff done guys. I'm a worship leader, a guitarist. So for me, learning my parts, getting the music right, practicing, all of the real physical stuff, which is really good, by the way. If you're not doing that, you should be doing it. That form, that, it's, it's, it's good. The form is good. We need form. Rivers need strong river banks. But I'm one of those river banks, I'm always like trying to put river banks in place, and I love that. And I felt God saying to me, Aiden, you're putting too much emphasis on the form. You're placing your confidence in the flesh. So I didn't just leave that behind. No, no. 
It's a change of mindset. Okay, I'm gonna do that, but now when I'm executing on it, okay, I'm not placing my confidence on that, I'm placing my confidence on you. Glorying in Christ Jesus, placing no confidence in the flesh. Sometimes we can be so fleshly, and sometimes flesh doesn't look bad. Flesh isn't always the sinful nature when you look at the meaning of the word. It's the Greek word socks. Sometimes it's just our physical bodies. Jesus had a socks. The word became flesh, Greek word socks. But are we placing our confidence in those things? I have been placing my confidence in those things. And God is leading me out of placing the confidence in what I can do and stepping out. And I still keep running to my flesh and my form and my structure. But God's leading us out. The structure is good, but let's not place our confidence in it. In ending right now, I wonder if you can please put up that slide. I had a prophetic picture for you, churches of Australia. This is it. Let's get that slide up of the statue of David. I didn't want anyone to stumble. Wherever your mind is going, don't go too far. Let me tell you about it and see why this is a prophetic word for you and for me and for the people we lead. Let me tell you a bit about the statue quickly. This is uh, Michelangelo's David statue created between 1501 and 1504. It's a masterpiece, one of the most famous artworks of all time that stands 5.2 meters tall, 17 foot tall for my American friends. Weighs 5,660 kilograms, that's 12,478 pounds, and was carved from a single piece of Carrera marble. Portrays David who killed Goliath. Eight million people a year visit the statue. Yeah. The detail carved into that stone is exquisite. Hence the pants. <laughs> so what you may be doing, <laughs> Too much flesh, sorry. <laughs> what you maybe don't know about this is that, and here's the word, that, that statue was worked on by two previous artists who, who gave up on the job because the, the marble was too imperfect. They were commissioned artists to do the statue. They started and they pulled out. The marble was too broken. The marble had too many imperfections. And here Michelangelo comes along at the age of 26. Is a prophetic word for the young. At the age of 26, creates this masterpiece. And, and here's, here's, the, here's the, the truth. That, that, that's what God wants to make of our lives. The imperfections that we have, the brokenness that we have. Let's go full circle to the beginning. Let's bring our brokenness to Him. The Father working the dirt. The master craftsman chiseling through the imperfections, making His work. But we can't run from the chisel. We can't run from His forming and fashioning. We've got to embrace it. We've got to keep in step with it because that's the end result. And the master craftsman does something exquisite and masterful with our lives. And then he sends us out to go find the broken chunks of marble everywhere we go. Maybe it's your leadership team. Maybe it's your potential leadership team. Maybe it's that life group leader who, 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 who you're gonna release as we get back. Maybe it's the people you're gonna invite to join your connect group. Maybe it's another ministry. Maybe it's something else. There's brokenness and God's gonna use you to fashion and to form through the fruits of your life and through your story. But just because you've maybe been handed something that's broken doesn't mean a masterpiece can't come out of it. And maybe that's your life you're looking at. Maybe that's the ministry you're looking at. Maybe it's this next generation looking at what the previous generation has given to it. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. Abide in me and you will bear much fruit. Fruitfulness in Scripture speaks about God's purpose for our lives, God's blessing on our lives, and God's promise for us who believe. Let us pray. We just welcome you, God. We are not perfect people. We live in a broken world and we suffer the effects of the broken world. And we each have areas that we're working on, but thank you, God, we're not gonna look at those today, we're gonna look to you, the perfect gardener, 
getting your hands dirty in the soil. And we just say, come. Just in your own way, in your own words, begin to tell him how much he means to you. Tell him how much you desire him. If you've been running from him, it's time to embrace him. If you feel you've... If you feel that you've just been lacking in fruit and barrenness is your portion, say, God, thank you for your promise today. Lift up the areas of my life that need to bear fruit.